call this meeting to order. It is 7 p.m. on Monday. Um, well, August 6th. <laughs> I didn't change it in my notes. Um, in attendance this evening, we have Crystal Brocky, John Ashby, Paula Cole, I'm Christine Malik, and we have Superintendent Unowski. Um, board members Tensing and Paulus are out this evening. Um, I would like to remind us of the Richfield Public Schools mission statement. Richfield Public Schools inspires and empowers each individual to learn, grow, and excel. And we will keep this in the forefront of our minds as we work together this evening. Um, we will start with review and approval of the agenda if anyone is prepared to make that motion. I will move the agenda as presented. I will second that. We have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and the agenda is approved. We will start with information and proposals and non-action items. Um, it is not a public comment night um, tonight, so we will not have that. And before we get to the superintendent update, um, as the board chair, I wanted to share with you that um, we completed, or the board completed Superintendent Unowski's performance review in July. Um, this is one of the board's core responsibilities. And we have made some improvements in that process in the past year, including quarterly check-in meetings with myself, Superintendent Unowski, and Vice Chair Brocky. Um, we also included input from the superintendent's direct reports, which I think was very valuable for all of us. Um, and we had input from individual board members on topics ranging from leadership and board relations to resource utilization, community relations, and professional development. Um, Superintendent Unowski has used that feedback and the strategic plan to work on um, his first draft of goals for this coming year, which he'll present later in the meeting. Thank you. So we will move on to um, the superintendent update. All right, so our first presentation this evening is actually going to be from our early childhood team. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge um, Later on in our agenda, we're going to be reviewing uh, policy 301 and 302, our org chart and our position assignments. We have some um, administrators who came to be welcomed to Ridgefield Public Schools today, uh, new members of our management and leadership. Um, and so I just wanted to share um, a welcome with them and also share a little bit of information briefly. I'm gonna start with our uh, middle school team, um, led by our new principal, Dr. Carla Hines. Uh, Dr. Hines comes to us with many years of successful principal experience, um, having been the principal of Creative Arts Secondary School, um, also a leader at both Crosswinds and Perpich uh, Center for the Arts. We're excited to be bringing Dr. Hines on to our middle school and looking forward to her uh, bringing some very strong leadership um, into Richfield Public Schools. So we're happy to welcome Dr. Carla Hines. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, sitting next to her, her, one of her two assistant principals and her new assistant principal, Mr. Stephen Flukas. Uh, Mr. Flukas also brings to us a wealth of administrative experience, having been an assistant principal and a principal um, in several locations. Uh, most recently, Mr. Flukas is moving to us from St. Cloud, where he's been a high school assistant principal. Uh, but he also brings some pretty significant extensive administrative experience at the middle school. And so he's excited to be teaming up with Dr. Hines and Mr. Finke, our returning assistant principal. So welcome to Mr. Stephen Flukas. Um, she was here uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, um, but our new Director of Human Resources uh, comes to us from being one of the human resource leads in Stillwater. Uh, prior to that, she had actually been in Clark County, Nevada, um, one of the leaders for the Nevada Las Vegas school system. So we're excited to be bringing on a wealth of experience and knowledge about human resources, and we're happy to be bringing uh, Ms. Brenda Nielsen as our Director of Human Resources to our team. Welcome, Brenda. And then you already noticed a name up there on our presentation, along with his partner, Amber Lampron, um, Director of Early Learning, Patrick Barrage. Um, Patrick has actually been a district leader and also a building principal at multiple levels in Michigan, uh, moving to the state of Minnesota and bringing his extremely strong leadership to our district office and to our early learning program. So we're excited to have not only Mr. Barrage join us as our Director of Early Learning, but he'll also be stepping up to the microphone momentarily with Miss Amber Lampron. And so instead of just smiling and waving, we're going to make Patrick perform for us tonight. So welcome to our team, Mr. Barat. Hey. So with that, I would like to welcome um, both Patrick and Amber up to the microphone, um, which is 
right up over there. We're going to hear about some of the exciting advances we have taken in the last year with um, Richfield Public Schools and our early childhood screening. And just as a quick review and reminder, obviously we um, used to be Richfield Bloomington Early Childhood and Richfield Bloomington Community Education. And in the last year, we became Richfield Early Childhood and Richfield um, Community Education. And so some exciting advancements have come on um, with early childhood and our early childhood screening. So with that, Mr. Barrage. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, good afternoon, Board of Education. Uh, this is a pleasure to uh, come to you to give you some feedback on our Screen at Three program. Uh, led by Amber and I am, I am replacing a great leader by the name of uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Carol Hut Hutton. And uh, so she's done a great job and I thank her for her leadership that she's done prior to me coming in. Uh, Amber will be going through uh, our process of the uh, Screen at Three program and its purpose and how it connects to uh, what we do here in inspiring our students here at Richmond Public Schools. I'll come back at the end and uh, give you some wrap up and also talk about a little bit of our vision for early learning. Hi, everybody. I know most of you are here not the new, new people. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you to Superintendent Finowski and to the school board members that are here. Um, I'm excited to talk about the early childhood screening as, uh, and the work that we've done in the past year. And as most of you know, we were in a partnership with Bloomington prior to this year, to this school year. Um, and now that we've had one full year under our belts, uh, we, and a grant to go with that. Um, early childhood screening is just a little piece of the work that we've done with early learning and community education, but I feel like it's a really important piece to talk about and highlight. Um, here's a little guy that uh, was screened over at Central. Um, so our first year with early childhood screening, we learned a lot, we hired a lot of team members, um, and, and with the help of a grant and some graded funding, we're able to do a lot of great work. Um, the grant started out uh, as a combined grant with Bloomington, and we, when we dissolved the partnership, we wrote our own grant, so Richfield had its own Screen and 3 grant starting in October. So after that, uh, with the help of Mary Clarkson's leadership and several other directors, uh, Carol Hutner <coughs> and Carol McNaughton Commerce, the community ed uh, director, we all got together and planned out how to use this grant to start our early childhood screening program off strong and also build sustainability right away. Because um, this grant is now coming to an end uh, as of August. Um, so the grant supported hiring new outreach workers, a screening team, and um, developing community, community partnerships. Here's a little picture of our screening team and um, <coughs> We were, we were able to hire people, two new Spanish-speaking outreach workers and one part-time Somali-speaking outreach worker. Uh, also, we have a school nurse who helps with the intricacies and oversees the screen. There she is on the right, Phoebe Anderson. She used to be at the high school, so many of you probably know her, and now she's at way down at the other end of early childhood, and she loves it. I think we're extending her retirement by like <laughs> five years, but she, she loves the change. and. She feels really good about the work that we're doing. Um, Christy Carr is a para who does screening as well as some uh, data and clerical work for the early childhood screening work. Um, and this is all due to the <coughs> grant and that other graded fun funding. Um, I, I feel like, like we have done the best <coughs> work because right away we started out with a vision of the philosophy of never give up on families. Just you know, if we know a family's coming in and needs a screening, uh, if they miss their first two appointments, we just keep calling. We might go out to the home. We might uh, go to the daycare and do a screening there. Um, we are co-located with WIC, so we're in the same office uh, in, with WIC, which helps a lot because we share um, referrals to each other. Uh, also, Mira, as you know, is over at Central and um, the early learning program registration is right there. Community ed programs they can register for right in the same building. Um, and we have a strong data system to support this uh, 
this program. And there he is, there he is again. We love that little little guy. So he, <laughs> you'll see him in the catalog too. He's all he's all over the place. Um, so here's some numbers. We were able to meet our goal of the grant, which was um, increase the total number of students screened. And also, it, most important is increase the number of children screened at three. And the reason we want to screen more kids at three is because we can then connect them to the resources that they might need earlier rather than right at kindergarten. Um, so we did increase the uh, total number of kids screened at three by about 30 and uh, 50 kids overall, which for Richfield, you know, pretty small district is, I felt pretty good about that number. Um, we're, we're working on increasing it even more. Um, and here's the slide that I think is the most important piece. And this is just a small piece of resources that we connected families to. So one example um, would be a family that came in and very connected to the community, uh, very active in their child's life, but had no idea that their kid could not see. So um, that early childhood screening at three, um, they found out that their child needed glasses and you know, the mom was crying because she thought, I can't believe I didn't know my kid couldn't see. Um, so that's just one small piece of the things that we um, might connect families to. Again, our preschool programming is right there, the registration, so we often screen a family and then walk them right down to register for preschool. Early childhood special ed team is in the same building, so we have that connection. Um, and the family education, early childhood family ed, other family resources that we've connected families to just is streamlined like we talked about before we dissolved the partnership. We really have made that work happen. Um, so it's, it's really fun to see this data. And the grant uh, supported the data tracking where we were able to have a data system to track all the follow through and follow up and connection to resources. Um, so future plans and questions for this piece of the program, we are still um, developing community partnerships. Uh, I just met with Richfield Alina two weeks ago and we're streamlining a referral process to come directly to us um, at Central so they can refer to screening and not just if they have a developmental concern but actually just for the early childhood screening. We figured out a way to do that. We already have that in place with um, Richfield HCMC which is now called Richfield Hennepin Health. In case um, not everyone has gotten that word yet, I don't think, because everyone says HCMC, but their official title is Richfield Hennepin Health now. <laughs> so that's the, uh, we already have a great connection with them and getting referrals all the time for screening, so that's been great to see. Um, I am presenting this work to the Governor's Early Learning Council as well, um, because they're interested in hearing more about the work. It was, we were just one of three districts that did this work on the project, so we're pretty proud of that. And um, Patrick is working on better connections with Head Start that's right in our building. Uh, in addition, we have, um, still I'm still working with United Way to see if there's a chance that they can continue funding in maybe a different way. Um, they've sent out some emails getting us together. So we're, we're exploring that possibility as well. So that was a lot, but anybody have any questions for me or Patrick before Patrick? Kind of sums up the, yeah. I do have one question about the grant since it is phasing out and just whether there are any specific implications for us of that grant no longer being available. Yeah. Um, like I said in the beginning, Mary Clarkson and um, Carol McNaughton Commerce, the director of community ed, were very, um, very careful when we planned that out, knowing we were getting the funds and they were only for one year. So right now, um, we, we do have it planned into the next you know few years. I think that's a better question for Mary going forward. Um, she knows a lot more about the funding than I do, but she's very clever. Um, but we do have, uh, right now, I know that it's not in the foreseeable future that we're worried about that work just disappearing. Um, but I do think that's part of why we keep exploring grants and applying for more as, as um, this work continues. Because yeah, it's been, it's been amazing to see that the work that we have. Um, and the other thing I don't think I mentioned was our outreach workers, the screening team, is, they're all also part of community ed. They do just a little piece of that screening, so they're all, their job is um, bigger than just screening, which is helping to sustain that, so.
So just to restate that, you know, as we built this from a one-time grant fund, Dr. Clarkson built in multiple years of sustainability into the program, because as the board has suggested that sustainability is one of the uh, visionary components of the work that we do. Um, we didn't want to come in with some strong screening and have it go away. Um, and so setting out a multi-year plan for budget, even though the, the funds were only really provided once, um, was within the planning for this, for this opportunity. Thank you, Amber. Um, and also to, um, to kind of piggyback on what was said by Steve, the, uh, really when we talk about vision and talk about learning, two, two distinct things we do want to point out. We are switching from an idea or an ideology <coughs> of just early childhood to early learning. So think of your district now not only being a K-12 district, but really, really we're looking at our families being connected to our, our district for 16 years, from zero to really 18. And that's really what we're trying to do. What really what it does is it allows us to really, really uh, get at to really our vision at, uh, in early childhood, which is to provide the highest quality of education that we provide for our children so that they are ready for kindergarten. That's really our vision as we support the district vision of inspiring, empower, and excel. Um, there, are, there are four areas or four goals that, uh, that our team uh, really wants to focus on. First one is really to, to establish relationships outside of uh, this district, whether it is uh, other child care providers, other third party uh, organizations and or uh, companies who can support some of this work. Uh, the other one is that we want to assess we want to also progress monitor, and then we also want to provide those resources necessary for our children to be successful. Again, getting them prepared for our K-12 our stream. And then the third one is really provide some resources to our community uh, to enhance uh, children's uh, progress at home. So one of, the, one of our connections, our initial connections are always home connections first. Uh, and as they start to um, matriculate through, then, then our buildings become more of the connection. But really their home presence allows them to uh, really grow and really start to apply education as opposed to just learning. And then the last one is uh, we're, we're here to be your, your marketing department. This is many times for our parents, this is the first time that our uh, families have an opportunity to meet Richfield Public Schools. We want, to, we want to put our best foot forward. We want to show them that we not only love them, we care for them, and that we'll provide the services necessary for them, for them to be successful, and they don't need to go anywhere other than to stay here. Uh, so those are really four of our primary goals, our four immediate goals, um, as, uh, as I move forward in, um, in getting up to speed, and as our team continues to work um, on our work with our families and our communities. Any questions? Yes, sir. How are you going to be more visible in the market or get more of a market share? Well, one of the ways we're going to do it is we have um, hired some uh, uh, outreach workers, and they're going to do exactly what that job suggests is our outreach. One of our connections are, is to make sure that we have a presence in our daycare, uh, in our daycare stream. We want to make sure that we have, uh, we're connected to our civic organizations as well as some of our religious organizations and also private organizations as well. So that's some of the ways that we're going to be doing those things. One of the things that we're doing even on the 16th is we're having our second annual family night, which is another way to make a connection to our, our parents. We're looking to expand our, our learning to not only be here on site in the district, but also do uh, some of our learning outside, uh, off site, either at some of our civic organizations or even into some of our apartment complex where our parents live. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Very exciting. <coughs> So there's an update on our screening and some of the exciting things going on with early learning. Uh, stepping up to the podium now is Mr. Hoji, who is going to be here with our referendum and capital facility team um, to give us an update on um, 
a series of regular updates that we have. So our referendum project update. Um, and so just as a reminder, every two weeks, our capital facility planning team meets together. Um, at all of our sites, there are meetings going on on an ongoing basis to have facility user groups. And Mr. Holsey is here to tell us a little bit about that this evening. Yeah. I'm going to do a quick turnover to uh, the team, team here from ICS and Wold. Uh, this is the first of two presentations <laughs> that we're receiving in August. Um, we'll be covering um, three of our buildings um, at this meeting, and then the high school building will be covered at the August 20th meeting. Um, the teams have been working with user groups and with the different um, groups at each one of the buildings, coming up with plans, and um, this is sharing that information on that schematic design process here with you tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you. Good evening. So as Mr. Holgey just explained, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Tonight, so uh, we're talking about central RDLS and the RSTEM projects, which we've completed schematic design. We put estimates on them, and we're sitting where we want to sit. So we're at a point where we can present these plans to you and say, here's our, uh, here's our plan moving forward, and we're moving into the next step, which is design development. And then that's all followed by construction drawings when we're ultimately ready to bid. So items completed to date and ongoing are uh, the core planning group meetings have been completed for RDLS, RSTEM, Central, and the high school. Uh, the design team has been having different meetings with the cities to discuss variances. We're adding some parking lots to a couple of the buildings, so we've got to get through all those processes, make sure we're meeting all the requirements. Uh, every other week we have the Project Oversight Committee meetings where we talk about our status, uh, next steps, make any decisions that need to be made at that time. And then also in the design process we have all the survey work. It's about 90% completed. We've had a few little miscellaneous, hey, we need a little bit more survey work here and there as the design progresses. But for the most part, those are completed. Um, IA has been working on the environmental reviews of the buildings. We're telling them, you know, this is what we're planning to do. We're going to demo the boiler room. They come back and then they give us a report saying, okay, there's this much abatement that needs to be done here. That type of thing so we can coordinate the cost of that and how it affects the schedules. And then we're also working on just different miscellaneous projects that pop up throughout this design process. Some of them are LTFM projects, some of them are things that have come up just throughout the summer. Uh, there's a project at the, at the art room here at the high school that the art teacher needs a little more space for some additional pottery wheels, so we work through that process. So that's kind of what the miscellaneous projects are. And then I'm going to turn it over to my class from Wold, and he can kind of walk through the, the design documents where we're at. Hey, good evening. Um, I wanna, before I jump into Central, I wanted to cover kind of two items uh, in particular. One is um, kind of the stage we're at as we're doing these updates. I'll try to give you an idea of what is a little bit different from one, from the last time we gave this to this time, because some of these things are relatively subtle. Um, part of our process in the whole design phase is to really dig into it with the, with the user groups that we work with and the, and the district staff, et cetera, just to, uh, dig in farther to find out what our needs are. And so it isn't always just as simple as just replacing this and that. Sometimes it's really kind of trying to un uncover other things. And so we have a tendency to go beyond, I guess, our scope a little bit at times. <coughs> we kind of do that on purpose in order to then bring stuff back a little bit. So I'll try to point out some of those things that we brought back since the last time that we, that we met. The second item is, um, uh, it continues to be uh, the LTFM, the long-term facilities maintenance part of this whole um, uh, project scope is something that does not show up very well in graphics. But I want to, again, continue to remind everybody that uh, it still makes up 70 to 75 percent of what we're doing. And so they aren't the most exciting things to show. That it really is um, the uh, mechanical and electrical replacements like, make up more than about half the overall scope. Um, there's lots of other things we would call architectural LTF thing, LTFM things like replacing doors. In other words, replacing things that are broken. So a lot of that really doesn't show up here, but I want to just really emphasize that it continues to be a huge part. Um, our teams uh, have been uh, continuing to go through all the buildings and really try to understand and try to figure out what, uh, what level of replacement and whether or not something should be on or off, because sometimes that does get a little bit arbitrary as well, but that's something we want to so uh, first building is uh, central. Again, not a lot of significant changes since the last time we presented. Um, one of the main, scope, uh, main scopes from the, from the referendum was creating a secure entry. Uh, as you might have remembered from the last time, we originally, when we first looked at this, we, had, uh, we looked at maybe doing the secure entry on the north side, which would be kind of this lower, lower left-hand corner. 
Uh, we made a decision that uh, the, the parking there really didn't make sense. We kind of moved it back to where the current admin area is. Um, we felt that that was still probably the best way to organize this building. Um, and so a couple things, a couple things that develop with that is one of the problems with where that admin is is it really doesn't have a great proximity to parking. And so again, we looked at and we mentioned this the last time of how can we add how can we add some parking there. And so we have done that. You kind of see a little hint of it off on the right hand side. Uh, we're looking at maybe a dozen spots. It's kind of intended as a visitor's lot, I would say. Um, just the function of this building really lends itself to having multiple entries. Um, you have the early childhood, you have the Head Start, and you have the community ed side. I don't necessarily see that changing. I think that they're, the way the doors operate, there's people coming in all different times. But I think we have, we have uh, at least built in the ability to say that those, when those doors are locked, that you do have a true visitor's door, much like we do in the other schools that we're, uh, we're starting to move together. Um, other items, um, again, a big aspect of this kind of, kind of fits within the LTFM scope was restroom improvements. We've pretty much taken every restroom in this building and done something to it, whether it just be aesthetics or obviously add the ADA portion to it. Um, the largest one would be at the admin area where we're, the bathrooms there were in okay shape but really didn't meet certain aspects of it. And so we kind of uh, decided that would be a good place to add some of the resources to, to make those better. And we also feel that because of the community ed and the whole gym and the community spaces, um, that it's, a, it's a nice thing. So after hours, essentially, the early childhood part of the building can be locked off and still have access to everything. So um, we think that that's a good way to do that. Um, Included a little drawing just of kind of where we are with the admin area. Um, each, of these, uh, each of these labels, other than say nurse, could have a different label. They could be an office, they could be a conference room, they could be, uh, right now we think that the uh, outreach staff will probably be there. Again, probably more likely to have visitors. And so uh, that's kind of what we've uh, set it up. And we still have, uh, we have opportunities for screening here, although we, we assume that the current, the current location up on the north side of the building is probably will continue to do screening. We've made some minor modifications up there as well. I don't know, do you have any questions on Central before we run? Um, I mentioned here the, the Central plan shows that parking lot on that south side. Uh, RDLS, um, again, uh, very similar, we have the LTFM scope, we have the uh, secure entry, and, and just like uh, Central, we've kind of uh, consolidated the admin area and had that vestibule so that when uh, uh, visitors come in, they are forced to be, go into the vestibule again just to keep that secure aspect of the building. We have, uh, continue to have three additions to this building, one being that uh, admin addition, uh, the second one being the kitchen addition. So the kitchen addition, um, really just kind of pushes the uh, pushes out of the current cafeteria, adds I think around 800 or so square feet to the cafeteria, and then obviously uh, uh, we're working with uh, uh, the director of food service to kind of and, and our own consultant to try to work out the kitchen areas here. Um, continue to have the uh, media center addition. Um, we designed the media center addition the way we're designing. Most of them in this, uh, these days, I guess, where we have more of an open area. Um, the area in front of the media center where it says media center open area really uh, is considered a flexible space. So we see that as where uh, uh, volunteers or people coming in to read with a child or something can use that area. It just becomes a little more of a flexible learning space. And again, we've just kind of shown some blow-ups of those areas. Um, uh, although we are giving a SMAP design presentation, we're certainly well into our design development, and so we've met with uh, all the groups and we're really looking into not only how, how uh, conferencing works, but um, what kind of uh, casework, cabinetry, all that kind of stuff. So we've really started to, started to add that sort of detail to the plans. Uh, again, mentioned the kitchen and the media center. Uh, the one thing that I didn't mention before I move on is the last, uh, the last update that we gave you, we had a couple of classroom bump outs on the north wing and the east wing. Uh, what we were trying to accomplish there is to create another resource area, kind of open flex area. Um, we have, uh, as, as Andy mentioned, we have kind of uh, been working through our budget issues. And I think we had mentioned at that time that we were hoping that one might fit, but uh, for the moment, 
it, it, it doesn't fit, um, and so we've taken that off. Um, I don't know if that's forever, but uh, for the moment, it's, uh, it's currently left. Thank you for sharing that, because that was the question that I was going to ask, Perfect. because a parent had communicated to me that you know they were curious to know more about that. So it sounds as though it is currently off the table for budgetary reasons, but if the finances change, that could be reevaluated down the line. Absolutely, yeah. It's still okay. a topic in our POC meeting, and so we're, uh, we'll, we'll see where it, where it lands once we kind of everything else figured out. Okay, thanks. At our STEM, um, again, we've made a couple of changes. I'll get to those when we get to the second and third floor, but uh, just a reminder, we, uh, we again created a small addition, um, uh, admin addition, kind of the reception area that's next to the secure vestibule, so again, the same format. Same format in terms of relocating the admin staff uh, over to the north, north side. And then uh, we basically have made a few adjustments where, where the previous admin was, we've uh, turned those into kindergarten. Classrooms, so we have six kindergarten classrooms of roughly the same size, and it's my understanding that that's where they'll be next year. They'll be need of six. We have pre-K up on the upper uh, northeast corner, and then a special ed suite down on the lower southwest corner, uh, with a few other little other variations. Um, toilet upgrades were also part of this. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but in, uh, if you're familiar with the building, uh, currently they have a boys on one corner and girls on the other. Um, and, that, and that basically stack, stacks all the way up. Um, we had heard through a lot of our meetings that that can be a little challenging, particularly with some of the little, little ones that are there. So we have divided each of those um, so that there's boys and girls in both corners, and that stacks all the way up. So again, I uh, think that's a, a positive mood and, and really fits in with the LTFM part. We're just replacing things a little bit differently. Administration area, uh, again, um, uh, very typical. We have uh, conference space is something that's, that's always needed. Um, we have some uh, the staff lounge. We've kind of consolidated where the assistant principal is and the nurse as well. On the second floor, um, the last, at our last presentation, we uh, focused a little bit on uh, these uh, open, flexible learning areas that we had shown on uh, the north and south corridors. And um, currently on this one, we kind of have that as, as, an, as associated with the media center. And we, had, we did have one up on the, on the south side, but the original, the original referendum scope really had us doing no programmatic work up on the third floor. Uh, last time we had shown kind of, a, kind of a similar type of thing with these essentially a total of four of these areas. Again, due to budgets, uh, we scaled back. But in lieu of not doing anything up on the third floor, we took some of some of second floor and essentially moved it up. So we made them very very similar. They both have they both have a, an open resource area. Um, we also kept uh, kept a lot of many more of the rooms in a sim similar configuration. Again, just to just to make sure that we were appropriate with where the budget is. Uh, we still are showing uh, another special ed area, kind of in the lower southeast southwest corner. Um, and then we have uh, the same bathroom groups and we made some, uh, some updates up in the lab spaces just to make them function a little more. Uh, let's go up of the media center, very, very similar. We have closed off, closed off areas, but, uh, but there are other areas that can be used as more flexible learning and uh, uh, for another. Third floor, as I mentioned, um, we've, uh, moved, we've moved the extended learning up to the south side of this hallway. The north side kind of remains as it is, just a hallway, and the classrooms uh, around the perimeter uh, basically stay the same. We've done another small uh, area for the special ed, uh, also in the spots, so those areas all stack as well. Uh, the exterior for both, uh, both of the buildings, um, as we've uh, talked about in the past, um, we are showing a new bus loop uh, that's extended and it does extend into the area that, that was the pool area. Um, I think we are currently showing a bus, a bus count of uh, 20, 20 or 22, something like that. And the idea is, is that we move all the bus traffic and staff traffic to that south side and uh, keep the, the, the north side as a parent drop off. <laughs> Any questions on either of those two buildings? Thank you.
Well, I don't even have any questions on the next few things I have to say now. So. so other progress, as I mentioned previously, we're continuing with city meetings. Um, Wold and their team has, have had recent meetings with the city and are scheduling upcoming meetings. Uh, everything's been going very well, as they've reported to me, which is great. Uh, the survey work, as I mentioned, is about 90% complete, and the environmental consultants are working on those abatement plans. Um, we've also got some other independent projects going. Last week, we started draining the pool over at uh, the middle school, and that cleaning work is well underway. Uh, the RDLS new playground is completed. We had a ribbon cutting ceremony there, which was very exciting. And we're working on getting some final site restoration done on that before school comes back. So get some sod in there around the edges of that. And then we're also working through some of the previously planned LTFM projects, such as the re-roofing here at the high school and some exterior door replacement. I actually do have a question about city meetings. Yes. Um, the uh, I, from what you said earlier, it sounded like it's around zoning and you know different city permissions that may need to be had. Are there any aspects of uh, the work as it's currently envisioned that you think will need to go in front of either the planning commission or the city council at any point in time, or is that all being handled within current? I think Mike can answer this better. From okay. my understanding, it sounds like we don't have any variances or CUPs okay. that we're going to be subject to. Okay. Which yeah, well, I mean, we will continue to meet with, as, as you know, the city has lots of different people you can meet with. Yeah. Um, so our first round with, uh, you know, more of the planning department, uh, they felt real optimistic that this could all be done internally. Okay. Um, obviously, we'll have chances uh, to meet with more of the engineering side and see if that changes anything, but uh, we're pretty optimistic. We've had two good meetings with them where they've kind of said the same thing. So. Great, thank you. Which is a big thing schedule-wise, if you get into those city review meetings, and all of a sudden it pushes the So we're continuing on into our overall communications plan throughout the projects. Uh, we have the project oversight committee meetings every other week on Wednesdays. Um, internal meetings are include those project oversight committees. Uh, monthly status reports will start getting sent out as we get construction going. Uh, we do issue the weekly status reports, which I see you guys are posting on your website. Excellent. And uh, externally. That ties into that. We've developed and maintained the project webpage on the district website so everybody can go there and see the facilities updates. And then progress design presentations at board meetings, such as tonight, and uh, work sessions. And then as we get farther into the design and get things dialed in, we'll start scheduling some open houses to invite the community to, to so everybody gets to take a look at this. Our design timeline uh, we're in schematic design right now on those three projects. As Mr. Holgey mentioned, we'll be back here at the next board meeting to present the high school project, same format on schematic design. The design development presentation will be early fall of 2018, and then the construction drawing will be in the fall, and then we'll be ready to go out for bed in the winter of 2018-2019. Any questions? I just would like to say I really appreciate the detail and I'm very happy to hear about the miscellaneous projects that ongoing maintenance type things are being taken care of as, as opportunity presents itself. And with this big of a project, sometimes it's that kind of thing can fall through the cracks. I very much appreciate that we're doing that regular maintenance. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, Mr. Kretzinger will bring up ideas and things that need to be done or requests that he has, and then we have to sit down and go, okay, how's this tie into the overall plan? Is this going to be touched in the next year or two or no? And the exterior door replacement was one of them that there's a definite need for, and so we went through and said, okay, these buildings, we're not going to touch these doors. I mean, the, like the middle school pool was an easy one. We're not going to, we don't need to touch those doors with any bigger projects, so let's get those doors replaced now and get that off the table, so. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we are now moving on um, to Superintendent Gold. Um, so Dr. Roby's going to get it, get set up to help me out with the presentation component. But as you uh, indicated earlier, um, we uh, met for closed session a couple of times, um, completed my evaluation. Um, board members outlined some of the broad-based broad-based goals we were looking at um, and some of the things that um, we wanted to talk about. And so tonight you're going to hear for the first time uh, first draft of my goals and as with other things, I'll present these tonight. We'll go through a second draft process before finalizing goals and then 
uh, reporting on them throughout the course of the year. Uh, just as a reminder, the goals break down into three areas with three mathematical formulas. Um, our goals are really about student achievement, um, so that's looking at specific data-based um, gains and performance uh, of our students. Uh, we're looking at process goals or working on some of those really key strategic plan strategies and activities designed to improve our district. Um, and then the final culminating individual performance component, which is the board and you all completing that evaluation of my, my overall performance. Um, from a formulaic perspective, mathematically, 35% of the overall evaluation is made up of student achievement, 35% uh, of those process goals, and 30% in regard to uh, individual performance, which again is those leadership areas um, along with um, multiple areas of data and multiple areas of feedback. Um, one of the things the board had asked us to do is take a look at some of the other areas and a wider range of areas that we are looking at student achievement and add some additional components. Uh, one, of that, one of those has been vision cards, um, which is one of the things that we're working on, and I'll talk about that in process goals, but from an overall achievement goal perspective, uh, we want to continue our progress in the graduation rate, continuing to look at uh, goals of 3%. Um, but then also continue to close that gap between our highest and our lowest <coughs> groups of disaggregated students. Um, in our pre-K and in our early childhood, um, a measure of proficiency towards readiness for school, and you heard about our early learning program earlier, we're looking at 85% or higher um, for our students participating in our pre-K and early childhood programming on the Teaching Strategies Goal, which is the assessment that's used by our organization for early education and an indicator that our program has successfully prepared our early childhood students. Um, it's also one of the ways to note if our VPK program and our early childhood programs are successful by taking a look at that data. We are going to continue a look at our MCAs in regard to math um, and also to reading, looking for that again, consistently trying for at least three-point growth. Um, but then also continuing as we did last year, uh, closing the gap between our highest and lowest students, um, disaggregated out data. Um, but then also taking a look at growth, um, looking at uh, math proficiency and reading proficiency improvement. And what we're going to do is each fall our students take the map. Um, which is the measures of academic progress. So all the students in our tested grades take that assessment. And there's a projection and it basically states where our students are in the fall. So that the uh, measures of academic progress math test suggests that if our tests were taken today, uh, here's the level of proficiency that our students would be at. And so we're going to compare our fall map and the expectations uh, with our spring MCA scores in reading and math. Um, and then as we continue to focus on our culture and climate, um, we want to continue to look at behavior incidences and continue to improve. Um, so we want to look at a decrease in suspendable incidents of 10% or higher across the district. And so we're also wanting to close the gap between our highest and lowest incident groups and really continue to improve our climate and culture um, and behavior across our organization as we implement our social emotional supports. Uh, from a process goals, and again, these are things aligned to our strategic plan. Um, we are launching our new K-5 literacy curriculum and also 612 math. Um, important to note that our math training began in July. Um, our Lucy Hawkins reading and readers workshop rollout began actually next week with all of our elementary teachers coming in for training well, beyond, well before the school year starts. <laughs> Um, we're going to implement and revise our vision cards with our board presentations. And so we implemented our promotion and marketing vision card um, and got some feedback on some revisions that will be in the next presentation. Um, but then we also will look at card D, which is um, aligning our financial and operational resources. And so that card will be presented in September or October um, as we gather that data and continue those four presentations throughout the course of the year. Um, I will continue to lead new input and participation groups. We're going to continue our work with Reimagine Richfield and hold, um, hold the opportunities to gather that large community voice. And then we've also launched the Superintendent Strategic Advisory Committee and then also the Extracurricular Advisory Committee, which is meeting actually later this week. Um, and so we're going to continue that work. Um, we're going to lead social emotional support system improvements. And so we have launched a safe and supportive schools group, so it's meeting to examine all of our policies, all of our practices. We're implementing supports in every building, and we're also looking at system alignment for our behavior and for some of the work that we're doing to support our students from a mental health and from a social emotional perspective. Um, you heard a little earlier tonight, we're looking to have me oversee our planning and start of our capital facility works. So again, um, those team meetings continue to occur regularly. Um, well, they said winter, I'm hoping for December, and that may change as I revise. We're looking for a launch um, starting at our high school in December of, of really um, hitting the ground running with our capital facility work. 
Uh, we're looking to increase our supports to staff, and so HR and Dr. Roby have continued to look and examine the level supports within our mentoring program. We've also realigned our QCOM program to move it from solely evaluative and feedback um, to adding significant time in terms of mentoring and supporting to con continue supporting our staff um, in some of the ways that they've asked for additional ongoing help. Um, and then we're looking to always expand and increase our equity work and increase our staff diversity. And so we're looking at a strong recruitment and hiring process. Um, we had an innocent classroom board training and we're on pace for all staff uh, to have an initial training and be completed with the first training for all of our staff this year, building sustainability into the future. Um, and then also we had a team of staff trained through the Minnesota Humanities Center to continue to expand our opportunity for equity training and bring wide-ranging voices um, and underserved voices into our community. And then finally, leading communications and marketing improvements. And so we're in process of reviewing and improving our social media work. You may have already noticed sort of the soft rollout of our district Facebook page, which will really launch um, when our teachers and staff come back at the end of this month. Uh, continuing to create more marketing uh, materials, including a video, adding communication support, and really doing a good job of telling our story of the successes and the things that are great that are happening within Richfield Public Schools. Um, some additional areas of data that we'll be looking at to analyze not just have we implemented, but are we successful. Um, we'll continue our district and superintendent survey, which launches typically in the late winter to make sure we're gathering that feedback on how are we doing in each of these areas and what is our overall performance. We continue to look at our market share and also the amount of enrollment applications we have to our district. Um, are we increasing or are those numbers not going the direction we would like them to? We're going to continue to look at our teacher evaluations and our staff evaluations of our trainings. Um, and then we'll also be looking at, as we implement our new curriculum, implementation data to see are we being successful at launching out the new curriculum that we're doing with our students. We're going to take a look at our social media work, to take a look at our website and our Facebook page, to look at our likes, to look at our hits, and to see how active we are in regard to people coming and gathering information from the work that we're putting out there. And we're also going to look at our teacher and staff evaluation data. So as we look at continuing to support our staff, is it actually resulting in ongoing improvements in what's happening in the classroom and what's happening for our students? Um, and so that was my first take um, at translating the conversation we had from feedback, um, aligning that input with our strategic plan. Um, some of these are some of the large activities we'll be working on with our strategic plan over the course of this next year. Um, as we head into year four of our district strategic plan and continue that focus uh, based on the plan we laid out in collaboration with our community starting when I began in 2014 15. So, with that, questions or input or feedback from the board? I, I wonder about numbers in all of these goals. I am very number goal oriented. And well, I do appreciate all of the goals, and I think they make a lot of sense, and, and I see a lot of growth based on community feedback and staff, uh, but how are we measuring that a year from now is what I'm curious to see. That was, we are totally aligned, because I think that um, in the second draft, that's what I would love to see, is how are these things going to be measured, so that we will actually know that on the front end. Um, and then I think, this more detail on that last slide before questions um, so that that is fleshed out at the same level as the other process and strategic goals and again with the addition of that measurement question how will things be measured because I, I think we can do these things and say that we check that box without it necessarily feeling like a success or leading to different outcomes so that's the type of thing that I'll be excited to see in the next draft. Well, I think we had also talked about um, how to kind of flesh out the partial meeting of goals, because mm -hmm. sometimes you can make some significant progress, um, but not completely meet the goal. So as far as like performance reward and that kind of thing, how, how do we want to handle partial? Like, is it halfway or, you know? So I think that's helpful when it comes down to it to kind of really be able to look at it and see. And, and have it figured out in advance rather than after the fact. Any input? Right, so this is following a similar process to last year. So this is where we began last year. Um, so then we will take a look at our um, database measures in regard to how are we doing from a successful perspective, including how do we know if we have met that goal and how do we know if we have partially met that goal, um, and then being very clear in terms of what those measures of success are so we can determine not only are we accomplishing those tasks, 
but it also allows us to look at and analyze the success or not as exciting, not success of, of those goals. Perfect. I look forward to bringing it back on the 20th of August. Great. We'll look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. So, Nick, we have no commendations today, so we will move on to the consent agenda. Is there any discussion, or is anyone prepared to make a motion? I move acceptance of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Ashby and a second by Ms. Cole. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and the consent agenda is passed. So we will move on to old business and board policy review. We are going to review board policy 586, gender inclusion policy. All right, so this is, well, this is the third read. This is actually realistically the second time we've seen the Richfield Public Schools um, draft gender inclusion policy. Um, and so just as a reminder, this was designed um, in collaboration with uh, MSBA um, and some proposed policies. Um, also aligns the MDE toolkit and also some of the areas that um, are expected and expected both by the board, but also by the state of Minnesota in regard to supporting all of our students. Uh, we've worked with the attorney for our district um, to craft a model policy and then have also made some revisions based on uh, board input. Um, the purpose is to make sure that we are in full compliance with that applicable law, but that we're also providing a safe and supportive and fully inclusive for students and all of our students, regardless of gender identity or gender expression. Um, and so, um, some of the changes that we have added, um, well, we do not have guidelines for you today um, because that's going to be a a uh, reasonably lengthy process to add specific guidelines. Um, Executive Director Mary Clarkson and Director of Student Services uh, Christina Gonzalez have begun drafting um, in collaboration with our attorney. Um, some guidelines to follow this or some specific procedures. Um, similar to behavior policy, we have overall district behavior policies, but then handbooks are then created to make sure that, that we align to those. So they're working on that. They're also going to work with the Safe and Supportive Schools group, um, which is a group of representative parents, staff, um, and individuals from across the district to gain in, uh, voice into, into that particular policy um, as we write those guidelines. Uh, some of the specific changes, um, if you look into section four in regard to gender transition, um, we, we added language saying steps taken to support students during this time will be done in collaboration with the student first, uh, then the parent with careful consideration given to student data privacy and consent. Um, then added, if appropriate, uh, school administration and so on and so forth. Um, basically showing that the student needs for us to get consent from them uh, prior to moving forward um, because their data privacy is based on the student and the student's wishes and the student's desire. Similar at the end, um, as each possible plan will be highly individualized, um, the plan will be developed, again, if there should be, based on higher up in this process. Uh, plan developed in collaboration with the student, parent guardian, school principal, director of student support services, and or additional appropriate school staff. Um, and so again, that would only occur if, as the beginning of that paragraph, um, basically done with the collaboration of the student first with consideration given to student privacy and consent. Uh, the additional um, ad is in section eight, uh, PE classes and intramural and interschool athletics. Um, and just added a statement saying, for participation on interscholastic athletic teams, this policy will not supersede Minnesota State High School League policy uh, re related to transgender student eligibility and participation. Um, and so basically what that is sharing, um, and that was shared by, as a question from one of our board members, is that if there are Minnesota State High School League policies, one, if we do not comply with those, we actually are not allowed to participate across a wide range of sports. So we're just wanting to be very clear that we won't we won't expect our policies to supersede the Minnesota State High School. Um, so with that, yes, um, I will let, open that up for questions. So if a parent came to you without student input, is that acceptable or not? Um, Kent came to the district, I should say. So parent comes to the district to ask for support for their students. Right. Um, at that point, you know, I would need to check. I believe at that point we support the parent, one-on-one um, -on -one with the parent or as staff with the parents. Um, but unless they bring the student in for a conversation with them and the student is present sharing that information, um, we wouldn't necessarily be fully approaching the student at the board. Uh, but we would only do that in collaboration with the parent present. Okay, 
think um, the policy overall as it stands looks very good to me. Um, I think the one thing I had a question about, though I understand why it's in here, is um, you know that we would maintain only those practices that have a clear and sound pedagogical purpose for uh, gender-based activities, because I was trying to think of what those things could be. But I, I understand that that is in here um, in the event that there are things that are just not in my brain <laughs> where that makes sense. Um, the broader question that I have, um, and maybe this will come into play with the guidelines, but I'm especially thinking about if we approve this at our next meeting, for example, this will be in effect for this coming school year, which I personally am very excited about. And I think this represents a real change as a, as a new policy, at least, for our district. And so what are we going to do to support our staff? And understanding this policy that now exists and in them having the resources that they feel like they need to, to know what to do in an instance like the one that John just raised. So um, that's not necessarily a question about this policy. I think it's just something that I would love to hear more about. Um, and apologies if this was discussed at the last meeting when I was asked. It was not. A okay. um, couple of things. So. We have a several day orientation for our new staff and we go through amongst the agenda items our policies. Um, and so we walk through our policies with our new staff. Um, we distribute all updated policies and all updated information um, through my assistant, Ms. Picard, to all of our current staff. Um, I think the important thing to note is that while this is a new policy, this is actually not a new practice. Um, and so I don't necessarily anticipate new things occurring through this particular policy. This is just codifying the things that we do um, and clarifying in board policy, um, A, that we are complying with the legal expectations um, of supporting all students, um, but it also codifies the belief in, of this organization or this school board is that we will do our work to support all of our students. Um, and so, Again, while it feels like a significant change from a policy perspective, it actually does not implement very many significant changes from a practice perspective. Uh, there are many cases um, within our district, or there are cases within our district, um, where students have already received the appropriate levels of support in these <coughs> So I know like our bullying policy is in the student handbook like for the high school. Mm -hmm. Is this something we would add to that? Or is it not? I'm just curious about if we want to get out there as far as a communication piece also or um, we will need to look at that from a communications perspective I know the safe and supportive schools group is looking at all of our policies the implementation of them they're reviewing all of our discipline policies um, and attendance and, and things of that nature across the entire district um, and so I expect um, actually a lot of those to come back to the board throughout the course of this year um, as a safe and supportive schools group looks at those policies looks at them from a vision of equity um, and realigns all of those. Um, they will also be looking at what are the best ways to communicate and support our students and staff in the implementation of our policies and of our practices. Um, so all that to say, yes, we're going to need to figure out how to communicate both this and then also our current and future um, discipline attendance um, and wide ranging policies that we have. Is dealing with these individual children, will there be any um, counseling as to possible repercussions of this desire to change gender equity or gender identity? Um, it's really dependent on each student and each, each particular situation. So there are times where um, this becomes a conversation with a classroom teacher or with a counselor or with a social worker or an administrator. Um, and there is conversation um, from a best practice perspective about um, gender, about transition, um, but that, those are based on individual relationships. Um, often a lot of the supports related to this involve family, involve supports from outside of the school, um, and only becomes a conversation for us when, when parents or students specifically bring that in for a conversation. I think the guidelines will help us with a lot of that part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything you would want me to look at or add prior to our next meeting? Um, the 
the only thing that I have noticed as I reread it prior, just prior to this meeting is what I didn't note in there is that the superintendent um, or that the we will imp we will create guidelines to implement, and so there isn't that statement um, where that is in some of our other policies that have a guideline to them. So we will look at having that just that extra wording in there just to clarify that there are guidelines that follow um, when we bring this back for final approval at our next meeting. All right, so just as a reminder, um, previously we approved um, ties and took our vote to dissolve. Um, so there's a slight complexity to this. Um, so National Joint Powers Alliance, now known as Sourcewell, has purchased ties um, based on an understanding <coughs> that the members of ties will um, purchase the service for one year from them at the same price as ties was paying, as we were paying ties. Um, so basically for no additional charge, um, the organization previously known as TIES was purchased by Sourcewell, um, of which we are participating in for the next year. Um, we are purchasing our software products from them at the exact same price as last year. Um, and the overall savings to the district um, was several hundred thousand dollars um, from having just left TIES completely. Uh, we also weren't in a position to be able and legally allowed to actually leave TIES until July 1st of 2019, um, of which we are still able to actually leave this agreement and leave Sourcewell at any point um, if we are not satisfied with the service or the supports that we are receiving. Um, and so to be able to um, do this work, um, we are needing to have our board allow us to allow the TIES group to reorganize um, and um, be able to be seen um, by Sourcewell. So just to confirm this does not represent any financial change to us as a district there is zero financial change to us as a district and this actually allows us to we have verbally committed to this because with this understanding sourcewell was willing to purchase and basically pay off many of the debts of the ties member districts uh, without us actually costing our district or our taxpayers um, anywhere near the amount of money that it would have cost So we are now customers, not owners. And so we can leave at any time from a source well perspective. Um, the directions to our teaching and learning team and our director of technology are the expectation is that we will be completely able to stand on our own with or without ties or source well or any other supports um, as of July 1st, 2019. Um, when Mr. Kling joined our organization, that was the expectation that he had 18 months to allow that to happen so that we weren't relying on any external groups. Um, and that aligned to the exact time frame of our organization taking the agreement to send a letter to Ty saying we were withdrawing. Um, 18 months is the expected timeline of withdrawal. Um, and so we are, we're in as customers by taking this step, um, an agreement that we were already taking anyways. And we will not be committed beyond that time unless we love the service. Um, I had a nice conversation with Sourcewell who were confused why we weren't in love with the idea of participating in this. Um, and so they know very well that they are having to prove themselves from a service perspective to our organization um, and that we have not um, fully received the su support that we felt we have asked for um, from Ties. Um, and so for us to remain in partnership with Sourcewell, we would need to see a level of service that we would not see. Um, because otherwise we would purchase software directly from the vendor and figure out methodologies for support either ourselves as a district or somewhere else that, that didn't come with the negative experiences that we may have had. Um, so we were pretty clear with them about what we need from them for us to stay. Is anyone prepared to make a motion on this resolution? I will move the resolution as presented. I'll second. We have a motion by Ms. Brocky, second by Ms. Ashley. This is a resolution, so I will pull the board. Ms. Brocky? Aye. Mr. Ashley? Aye. Ms. Cole? Aye. And the chair votes aye, and the resolution passes. I'm glad it passed. I've already signed it. <laughs> we didn't have to sign it to <laughs> Um, so we, we could have shredded that, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we have a motion by Ms. Brocky, second by Ms. Ashley. Second. 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 Second
Um, so we will move on to the updated 302 position assignments. All right, so I spoke about this in the superintendent report briefly. So there's 302 position assignments. I'm going to give the background on that and 301 org chart at the same time, so I don't have to talk about both. So we have five new members of the management team. Um, just as a reminder, um, Brenda Nielsen, our new director of HR, replacing <coughs> Joel Miltier, who took a promotional position. Um, Mary Pat Messler, um, replacing, and she'll be here on the 20th to greet you all. Uh, replacing Jean Cady, who retired after many years of, of faithful, exceptional service to Richfield Public Schools. Uh, Patrick Barrage, Director of Early Learning. Uh, replacing Carol Hutner, who spent a long time in charge of the Richfield Bloomington Partnership and then came to us to help us launch our program. Uh, Dr. Har Carla Hines, new principal of our middle school, replacing Mr. Zan or Dr. Zambrino, who is the new assistant superintendent of Minneapolis. Um, and then um, Moving from a dean to an assistant principal, adding Stephen Flukas as an assistant principal in the middle school to continue providing additional social emotional supports to all of our students and, and supporting all of our staff. Um, so that is represented in the position assignments 302, um, followed right after that in our graphic, um, our Richfield Public Schools org chart. about this um, but we had a very exciting opportunity with the Richfield dual language as we launched the um, elementary student sized playground for our Richfield dual language students where they had been playing on a very small playground for uh, previous years and they um, worked extremely hard and so we're very proud of the donation of the Richfield dual language school parent student or teacher student organization their PTSO which donated $23,069 to the building of the school's new playground and while that was their donation, they also worked extremely hard receiving grants from the county um, and additional external financial support and then also support from their district in, in terms of launching their new playground. So we're very proud of the work and thankful for our, our PTSO at the Richfield Dual Language School. What well, was the district share on that? Um, where we ended up? 75? I, I'll I just, double check, but it was. Oh, I just couldn't remember. Yeah. It, was, it is a big improvement. My kids in preschool played on that same <laughs> playground that they were playing on. So it was Absolutely. very nice. Of them. And they have worked for many years raising the funds for that to work very hard. Yes. With, with the, just a quick comment with that, we were able to bring down the PTSO contribution because of funds that were raised as part of the bond referendum. Oh. for playground improvements at each one of the sites. So district contribution went up from the original grant application and the PTO um, contribution went down a little bit. Would anyone like to make a motion to accept this donation? We move that we accept this donation, this donation we gratitude and a uh, big uh, applause to the there's a lot of work, a lot of lobbying through this uh, playground, so, and a lot of them, their kids won't even be there, but uh, it's a big gift to our, uh, to our students and our community, because they're going to use it. I'll second that. Let's make a motion by Ms. Cole, a second by Ms. Bakke. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> the chair wants aye and the donations are accepted. And we will move on to advanced planning and the legislative update. All right, so we are obviously in the quiet time of the legislative season. I uh, just received recently AMSD, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, asked for us to begin considering our top priorities. 
Um, and so one should anticipate at our coming meeting, we'll be talking about our legislative platform, some of the things that we've talked about in the past, and some of the things that we will continue to look for in the future so we can align our policies and, and requests in our platform to AMSD and also the needs of Richfield Public Schools. So we'll be doing some of that work in the, in the coming weeks. And information and questions from the board? Do we have uh, a few ideas about what we're going to tell uh, about the legislative uh, priorities that we have? Or are we still gathering? Are we going to continue what we have been working on in the past? Um, I think what we're doing at present, so there is an AMSD meeting before our next school board meeting. Um, what we found to be successful um, and is continuing some of the work that we have been doing, which is in the areas of special education cross-subsidy, um, but then also really listening to what are some of the significant topics that are available at the Capitol and some of the things where MSBA or Minnesota so or the School Boards Association, the Association of School Administrators are looking at as some of the key components for us to really focus our time and energy. Um, a lot of things also come into a little bit tighter focus. There's a primary on this, um, the 14th of August, I believe, um, and so there will be some more information about what might be the top priorities of some of our likely um, lead candidates for some of the major office positions, and so that can also help us shape some of the conversation. Uh, we have typically finalized our platform in October, November, um, although we may do that a little earlier this year as the, set, as the session starts in January. So, especially across subsidy, I would say for sure, um, and then we're really going to look at what are some of those other areas to focus on. Are there areas that you were thinking about that you would like us to uh, consider in that conversation? I'm sure I'll think of something. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, the one thing I was going to share is just uh, our Intermediate District 287 partners, uh, as you probably know, have been um, doing a large facility project themselves with the pretty much total renovation of a building that is now called the Ann Bremer Education Center. And so our support on that, of course, was, was critical uh, to them being able to make those changes to a facility that is in Brooklyn, I think it's Brooklyn Center. Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center, and the ribbon cutting is coming up in August. I know it is a bit of a distance for all of us here in Bridgefield, but I just wanted you to know that um, that ribbon cutting is taking place on August 23rd at 3 o'clock p.m. in case any of you would like to attend. Um, they're going to have a, a ceremony to just sort of honor um, Ann Brummer, who the center is named after and is a, a former 287 board member. Um, and then there will also be opportunities to tour the new building. Um, so you're welcome to be there, and I, I plan to be in attendance myself. Um, I was able to attend last night an MSBA, like an early bird seminar to their summer seminar, and um, it was on youth and mental health, and it was very interesting. Um, in some ways, it was really nice to see, I think, listening to um, other board members talk about their experience and what's going on in their schools, I could see just how far ahead we are in our district with the discussions in um, Reimagine Richfield that we had where we, the students were bringing up, you know, things about mental health and that some of the things they were talking about that were missing from other districts were like awareness and, and issues with stigma and I really feel like that's not one of the main issues those aren't the main issues that we have like it's other students are aware and our staff are aware and I don't think the same stigma that you sometimes see or used to see is there because people talk much more openly about it so it was a um, very interesting experience Anyone else? Um, one piece of information, just as a reminder, the Athletic Extracurricular Advisory meets on Wednesday of this week at 6.30. Um, we'll be talking about um, a couple of presentations we've had here, including marketing um, and logo, uh, logo and communication and mascot pieces. Um, and then also, as you remember, probably the Board Policy 979 with the Guidelines 979-1, which are the Community Use of Schools. Uh, we've kind of put on the back burner for a period of time, so we'll be addressing that with 
uh, that group on, on Wednesday to really gather some of that direct input on, on fees and usage um, so that we can really take next steps with that policy and bring that back, uh, bring that back here in the coming months. So we will move on to future meeting dates. Um, our next meeting is August 20th, 7 p.m. It's a regular meeting of the school board with public comment. And then our September 4th meeting, which is a regular school board meeting, um, which will be after the first day of school. It is a Tuesday, right? And it is yes. a Tuesday. Did I say Monday? No, you didn't. But you um, didn't say. I just wanted to make sure that I But it is right a time. Tuesday after okay. the first day of school, the day after the day. Are there any suggested future agenda items? Just as a reminder, because I know Mr. Paulus would ask, um, <laughs> we'll take a look at where we are in terms of anticipated enrollment to where our applications look. Um, and so we usually do that once in August. Um, and then we don't typically look at things on the first day of school because those counts are pretty tough, but we definitely uh, take a more formal look um, second meeting in September to talk about the students that have been there prior to it, that later count. So we'll, we'll be back with some information on, on what we're looking like in terms of applications and things <coughs> of that nature on August 12th. You just say that, I, I, Christine, I know you have brought this up in the past, but to have a document that outlines the general information that is top, covered on an annual basis at the different meetings, because I didn't bring that up because I knew we were going to talk about it, but to be able to have that actually even in our board packet so public and community members can see, oh, it's going to be at that meeting that they talk about that instead of it needing to sort of come up um, just on an ad hoc basis when we know those are pretty reliable discussion topics. Someone would like uh, to make a motion to move to close session for negotiation updates. I will move we go into closed session for negotiation updates. I will say. So we have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Mr. Ashby. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and we will now move to close session in line with the Minnesota statute 13B03 for contact. Contract negotiations after a short recess. <laughs>